Um, but we're going to going to make a start. Um, and hello and welcome, everyone. Please do say who you are and where you're from um, in the chat. We have um, every continent represented and 44 countries in terms of people who are attending the conference. Um, of course, it tends to be a bit UK and, and US uh, centric, but we're uh, really delighted um, as an organization to be able to host these uh, free publicly available uh, webinars. And as such, um, um, OASPA is actually going to expand its webinar um, uh, events um, this year. And in support of that, we have um, uh, opened a sponsorship program to enable us to keep them free and available uh, to everyone. And so I would just like to thank um, the Royal Society of Chemistry who have sponsored um, this, this webinar. And, and because we are excited to be offering such an expanded program of webinars, we would also welcome any other sponsors um, um, to help us keep these webinars um, uh, open, open to everyone. Uh, OASPA is a, is a tiny organization with a big heart and a big ambition, but we rely on support and, uh, and membership and conference delegates and sponsors um, to actually make all this possible, as well as lots of volunteer time. And uh, with that, I'd also like to welcome all the speakers who have come to uh, today to, to answer the question, so can publishing respond to a crisis, an evidence-informed approach. Um, and um, we have uh, Hannah Hope, um, who's from Welcome and is the open research lead uh, at Welcome. And previously she worked for a scholarly society and did a PhD in molecular biology. Uh, we have Stephen Pinfield um, um, from Rory. And he's a professor also of information services and management at the University of Sheffield and um, associate director of the Research on Research Institute. Um, and we have Jessica, who is the executive di director of ASAP Bio, which is a research driven nonprofit organization working to promote innovation and transparency in life science publishing um, across all sorts of interesting areas, preprinting, peer review, and that sort of that sort of issue. Um, also, we have uh, Robert Terry, who currently uh, he works for the World Health Organization, currently for the special uh, program for research and training in tropical disease. Uh, but he's worked extensively um, across the World Health o Organization and actually also worked at uh, uh, Welcome beforehand. At the World Health Organization, um, he's responsible for knowledge management, open access, data sharing and ensuring evidence is actually translated into a policy and practice. So it, it fits, fits well uh, with this um, webinar. Um, and we also have uh, uh, Stefano Vianello, who is just completing his PhD. Have you actually, have you actually, uh, have you got it? Congratulations. So he's got it between before the time we invited him uh, last year and now. So many congratulations, uh, Stefano. And what uh, uh, Stefano uh, um, has done his PhD in um, uh, at Lausanne in, in Switzerland in uh, developmental and stem cell biology. And we were particularly interested to bring him on today because he's looking, uh, he's already anticipating the future way that researchers will be publishing um, in a prefigurative way. There's, uh, if you, uh, there's a blog post listed on the website, go and read it. He's already actively preprinting. And we've also got uh, Ludo Voltman, who is um, Professor of Quantitative Science Studies at the Centre for Science and Technology Studies in Leiden University and also Associate Director of the Research on Research Institute. So what we're going to do is we're going to start this programme. Uh, I've already thanked uh, the Royal Society. <laughs> that, 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 that happened. Can we, could, we slip, could we go back to that other slide, uh, please, Ruby, just so people still have, have their names and you can get the Twitter handles if you, if you wish. What we're going to do is, is this is essentially about a report that was written um, under the leadership and design of uh, Rory, uh, Ludo and Stephen in particular, um, looking at how uh, publishers responded uh, and others in scholarly communication responded to the COVID pandemic. What actually changed as a response uh, to the COVID pandemic? 
Um, and this was in part in response to a statement by a Wellcome Trust um, that all published research about COVID should be uh, um, open access, there should be preprints available, the data should be available, um, we, we can, uh, they will be going into it. And, and, and also from uh, um, um, calls from the World Health Organization. And so that's why we thought it very interesting to have Rory present uh, what the actual evidence is of what publishers did and, uh, and, and, uh, and then get a response uh, first from um, Robert uh, uh, in terms of the World Health, Health Organization and then from Hannah and then from uh, Jessica as, start a, a, as part of an organization that's actually advocating for change and then Stefano who is actually doing the change and as a researcher and as part of that change. So I'm gonna stop there and hand over to Ludo and Stephen. Um, one, oh, one other thing, just please put your questions, I think in the question and answers uh, or, uh, or the chat. Bernie will tell you in the chat what to do with it and start your questions as soon as you like. We're gonna try and get to them. Uh, we'll get to them at the end and, and bring them together and, and um, try and make sense of everything we're doing. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much, Katrina, uh, and hello, everybody. It's it's great to be with you. It's great to see so many people on the call. Um, so thank you very much for coming along. I'm going to uh, share this presentation with Ludo Waldman. Um, what we'll be doing is introducing you to uh, the report that was published uh, last month uh, called Scholarly Communication in Times of Crisis. And I'm sure that Bernie can share the link to it if you haven't already uh, seen it. I'm going to kick off with sketching out some of the context for the report. I'm then going to hand over to Ludo, who's going to share with you some of the key findings of the report. And then I'm going to come back and uh, talk about some of the recommendations as a basis for, for discussion. So if we then move on to the, the next slide, the key point I want to make in relation to this is that this was a collaborative effort. Um, as well as uh, several staff from Rory involved in the report, there are a large number of colleagues from publishers and other publishing organisations, as well as others involved in the design and the production of this piece of research. And one of the key points I want to make, apart from acknowledging all the other co-authors, is that in Rory and indeed I know other people involved in this space are very interested in continuing this work alongside practitioners to develop a, an evidence-informed um, kind of practice going forward and so that's something we want to to raise in this um, in this seminar. Okay so let me begin by um, talking about the context and the context is a set of commitments, as Catriona has mentioned, made at the beginning of the pandemic by a number of organizations in the research ecosystem. In, in January 2020, led by uh, the Wellcome Trust, a large number of different organizations um, came together and issued a statement, a set of commitments, in which they agreed to disseminate research as widely as possible and as early as possible to support the effort to combat the, the pandemic. That was signed by over 160 organizations um, from around the research system, including funders, publishers, infrastructure providers, and research uh, performing organizations, as well as others. And then in the first quarter of 2020, a number of those stakeholder groups uh, developed further on the commitments that they were making in relation to their area. Amongst them publishers who came together to um, implement this commitment to greater openness. And one initiative in this area was the Rapid Re Review Initiative, with whom we in Rory have worked to analyse th their work um, from the period when they first began to the summer uh, last year. And that's the period that our report covers. Now, between them, if we go on to the next slide, these different statements made a number of commitments which we have summarised. They're phrased in different ways in the different statements that were issued, but they amount to these major uh, commitments or categories of commitments. First of all, there was a commitment to making COVID-19 research openly or freely accessible insofar as that's possible. 
There was also a commitment to pre-printing, that is sharing pre-refereed versions of research in order to accelerate communication, as well as uh, disseminating widely the research outputs themselves. Data was also uh, part of this, and there was a commitment to sharing data that underpins COVID-19 research as widely as possible. Uh, the publishers added a couple of other additional commitments. One is to speed up publication times, um, to accelerate the peer review process for COVID research, and also, interestingly, to facilitate early evaluation of COVID research through peer reviewing preprints and to sponsor a number of different initiatives that uh, endeavoured to do that. And so what our report does is look at these commitments and evaluate the extent to which they've been realised um, over the course of the pandemic. Let me now hand over to Ludo to take us through some of the findings. Uh, thank you, Stephen. Um, I indeed uh, would like to share with all of you some of the key findings of, uh, of our work. And I will do so by going through all the five um, commitments that were made at the beginning of the pandemic, starting with the commitment to uh, uh, open or free accessibility to COVID-19 research. Uh, what you see in this graph is the number of peer-reviewed COVID-19 outputs um, per month. Uh, and you see a breakdown, a breakdown by um, uh, open access type. We follow here the classification of uh, unpayable. Uh, so we distinguish between gold, hybrid, bronze, and green open access. And then of course we have uh, closed content. So green open access is uh, uh, content that is not accessible, not freely or openly accessible in the journal, but there is an open access version in a repository. Bronze open access refers to uh, uh, content that is freely accessible in a journal, uh, but there is no license attached that uh, enables uh, reuse of that content. So many of us would probably not consider this to be uh, proper open access. And most publishers also have labeled this as free access on their, their uh, website. Um, so what we see is that uh, most COVID research uh, is indeed openly or freely accessible. Uh, in many cases, it is actually what is called here bronze open access. So it is freely accessible without any uh, uh, reuse rights. Um, also a smaller, smaller share is green open access, as you can see. There is also closed content. So there is COVID-19 research that has not been made openly or freely accessible, but this is a relatively small share. So about 10%. Um, our conclusion basically is that to a large extent, the commitment that many publishers made at the beginning of the pandemic, the commitment to open or free accessibility to COVID-19 research has indeed been uh, realized. I will now go to preprinting. And for preprinting, the, um, uh, the picture is a bit more complicated. So as Stephen explained, uh, many organizations, publishers, but also many other organizations made this commitment to uh, basically preprint all COVID-19 research. So the graph at the left shows again in light blue, it shows the number of peer reviewed COVID-19 outputs like we also saw on the previous slide. But in addition, in dark blue, it shows uh, the number of COVID-19 preprints. So what we see is that in the first months of the pandemic, actually the number of preprints and the number of peer reviewed outputs was quite similar. So a lot of preprinting took place, um, but we also see that the picture changes. After the first few months of the pandemic, we see that the number of peer reviewed outputs kept growing and it has reached a kind of stable level of about 12,000 peer reviewed COVID-19 outputs per month. On the other hand, when you look at the preprints, you see that there's a small decrease and it has stabilized at about 2,000 preprints per month. So the overall picture is that we see many more peer reviewed outputs compared to the number of, 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 of COVID-19 preprints. But the early months of the pandemic clearly show a different picture. At the right, the graph at the right shows which share of all the uh, peer reviewed outputs were also uh, preprinted. So the share of all the, pre the peer reviewed outputs that have a link to a preprint. Um, the bottom line is that we were able to find such a link using our algorithms for about 5%. About 5% of the peer reviewed outputs have um, a preprint that we were able to identify. Uh, there might actually be a, bit, a few more, a bit more of these uh, peer reviewed outputs that have a preprint, but we were unable to find it. But it doesn't really matter for the conclusion. It's clear that 
actually only a small share, a small share of all the uh, COVID-19 outputs were pre-printed. Um, and therefore the conclusion is that this commitment to pre-printing that publishers made, but that also funders made and, and research organizations, this commitment has not at all been realized, which I think is quite uh, a disappointment. Here, by the way, you see a breakdown by publishers. So you see how different publishers have been able to encourage authors, to stimulate authors to preprint their work. Um, so most publishers, when you look at the blue dots, you see that most publishers are at a level of preprinting that is close to 5%, so the overall efforts that we found. But you also see that there are a number of publishers that managed to reach higher levels of preprinting. So these publishers apparently managed to uh, stimulate preprinting in some way, uh, in line, of course, with the commitments that were made at the beginning of the uh, pandemic. Um, then there's the commitment to data sharing. Um, there have been a number of studies already in which uh, researchers made an attempt to uh, um, analyze the extent to which COVID-19 research data indeed has been shared. These studies all take different approaches, but the conclusion is basically the same. Uh, the conclusion is that the commitment to sharing COVID-19 research data has not been fulfilled. Uh, the level of data sharing is still relatively low. Uh, there are clearly positive exceptions. Um, so we see that, uh, uh, for instance, uh, the sharing of uh, genome sequencing data has, of course, been highly important, especially at the beginning of the, of the pandemic. So this is a positive exception. We also see that individual publishers have developed initiatives, like some of the publishers in the Rapid Review Initiative, initiatives like um, uh, making stronger encouragements of data sharing or even mandating data sharing. But the overall picture still is uh, that uh, data sharing is relatively low. Um, the next commitment was the commitment to speeding up publication times. And um, what you see on this uh, uh, slide, you see a graph that shows individual journals. These are journals that have published uh, a relatively large number of COVID-19 articles, uh, focusing, by the way, on articles that were submitted in April 2020, so in a relatively early stage of the pandemic. Um, we see for each journal the time from submission to publication, both for the COVID-19 articles, that's the vertical axis, but also for the non-COVID articles on the horizontal axis. And as you can see, for almost all journals, you see that uh, publishing COVID-19 articles took less time. This could be done more rapidly than uh, uh, the publication of non-COVID articles. So in that sense, indeed, many journals, many publishers managed to speed up uh, the publication of COVID research compared to non-COVID research. And as you can see, in, in many cases, actually, the, 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 uh, the difference is really quite substantial. Um, we also managed to analyze uh, data on rejected uh, articles. So a number of publishers participating in the, in the, in the Rapid Review Initiative and also uh, uh, co-authors of, of the report that we published, they actually shared data with us on um, rejected articles. So what you see here at the left is um, the rejection rates, both for COVID articles and for non-COVID articles. Um, for almost all journals, so each dot again, again is a journal, for almost all journals, you see that the rejection rate is higher for COVID research than for non-COVID. And typically the difference is quite large. So this gives a kind of confirmation to this idea that many of us, of course, have this idea that there is quite a lot of COVID uh, research that is of perhaps questionable or lower quality. Um, and that seems to be confirmed by these high rejection rates that we see at the left. Um, at the right, you see the time that it has taken these journals to reject uh, these, these articles. And again, there's a comparison between the time from submission to rejection for COVID research versus non-COVID research. And quite clearly, we see that it uh, took, on average, uh, much less time for COVID articles to be rejected compared to non-COVID articles. So also, when you look at rejections, many publishers and many journals managed to do this in a uh, quite rapid way, which you could, of course, say is a good thing because it means that researchers can uh, uh, start improving their research and, and can perhaps submit it elsewhere without too much delay. Um, the final thing that Stephen mentioned, the final commitment that was made, at least by the publishers participating in the Rapid Review Initiative, was to also um, support new forms of peer review outside the traditional journal publishing uh, um, process, uh, but forms of peer review organized around preprints. 
And what we did is we did a large scale survey of authors of COVID-19 preprints. And what we learned from that survey is that slightly more than half of the authors, indeed, they got some form of feedback on their preprint. Uh, that's of course not always feedback in the that is similar to traditional peer review, but at least it is some form of of, of feedback. Um, in uh, about one out of four cases, you can see that in the chart uh, at the left, one out of four cases when an author got feedback that was actually quite detailed feedback according to the author. So feedback that presumably is similar to what you get in a peer review process. In other cases, the feedback that authors received was perhaps a bit more superficial. So for instance, suggestions on extensions of the research, small corrections, or just something like, thank you, this is uh, really interesting work. Um, at the right, we see the uh, changes that authors made in response to the feedback they got on their preprints. So we make a, uh, a breakdown by, different, by the different sections of a research article. And then you see that actually the section that was most often changed in response to feedback is the discussion or conclusion section, which you may of course argue is in some sense the most important section of an article. So in almost 40% of the cases, authors that received feedback, they made changes in response to that feedback to the discussion or conclusion section of their, of their article. Um, according to the authors, most of these changes are minor. So in about 10% or slightly less than 10% of the cases, authors told us that they made major changes to their uh, discussion or conclusion section in response to uh, the feedback they got. Uh, of course, it's important to be aware that feedback can mean many different things and it can also be uh, given in many different ways to authors. So we also asked for that and actually authors told us that a lot of feedback is given through private channels uh, like email. Uh, but there's also quite some public feedback on preprint servers or on social media, for instance. Uh, but it's a mixture of all kinds of different uh, feedback and not very structured, perhaps. Um, and therefore, it's interesting to also look at these uh, platforms for peer review uh, of preprints. And two of these platforms are actually part of the initiative of the COVID-19 Rapid Review Initiative. And these are platforms that we have looked at in more detail. So one is Outbreak Science Peer Review and the other is um, uh, Rapid Reviews COVID-19. That's an uh, overlay journal that is uh, 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 set that was set up by MIT Press. So both of these platforms, they publish peer review reports for preprints. Um, they do that in different ways. So in the pre-review pre platform, basically anyone can uh, uh, write and post a, a review report. Uh, the MIT platform is a bit more similar to, to a traditional journal. So there's an editorial team that selects preprints and that invites experts to write reviews. But in the end, both platforms publish openly uh, uh, review reports for COVID-19 preprints. And in that sense, I do think that both of these platforms are examples of uh, innovations in, 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 in peer review in a phase that might actually show us what the direction in which the system may uh, uh, move in the coming years. At the same time, we also need to acknowledge that um, these are relatively small scale initiatives. So both platforms, uh, they published a few hundred review reports, which of course is a, a modest number in the light of the overall volume of COVID-19 uh, research. Um, uh, Stephen, let's go back to you. Okay, so what we'd like to do now is talk through our recommendations, or at least the headings under which we made recommendations. But first, a couple of points about some um, key learnings from the uh, project as a whole. First of all, this uh, is pretty clear that most, if not all, of our results illustrate the power of openness, of open access, of open data in particular, but indeed open science in general. And that's demonstrated by the fact that. Um, uh, the, the research was, was got out there earlier than would normally be the case and was able to inform policy as well as drug development uh, and so on. And we do make the point that this particular uh, it, it, you know, situation has illustrated the power of openness, but also the potential of that could extend much more widely to other um, major global challenges as well as other areas of uh, um, societal uh, benefit. And so it really illustrates the power of openness, which could be applied much more widely. Um, the second thing is that it's very clear from our results that no one stakeholder group is responsible for uh, making change in this whole area. Rather, change 
uh, an improvement in scholarly communication comes as a result of genuine collaborative effort through greater coordinated action. And so many of our uh, recommendations focus both on openness and on uh, collaboration. So if you move on to the next slide, you can see the major headings under which we made um, recommendations. We made 16 recommendations in all, but they were under the following areas. One is a greater acceleration and intensification of open science, particularly open access, but also uh, open sharing uh, of data. Next is a more concerted action in the area of preprinting. We saw that le levels of take up of preprinting was relatively low, even in the context of a global pandemic. And so um, there are different responsibilities, we argue, on the part of different stakeholder groups to move that ahead in, in different ways. A greater emphasis on, on data sharing, once again, requiring joint effort of the players, creating a more easily usable infrastructure and standards are some of the recommendations we make, for example, as well as in uh, addressing issues around the incentives uh, structure, however challenging that may be, that seems to us to be really key in this whole area. Uh, journal peer review processes as well, because of the pressure that the pandemic placed on them, it's illustrated the whole system is under, under a great deal of pressure. So um, this isn't just a matter of working harder, it's also potentially a matter of working smarter in terms of the way in which peer review can be dealt with uh, moving, moving forward for the system as a whole, requiring greater innovation, we would suggest, uh, in that area. And also one part of that could be um, more work in the area of peer reviewing preprints as one form of early evaluation of research that could help address bigger pressures in the peer review uh, system. And finally, we, we recommended that there needs to be a greater sharing of evidence in this whole space, greater avail availability of data and metadata that enables this in evidence-based approach to take place. Now, the details of the recommendations are in the report, but those are the key areas where we made recommendations. Finally, what we'd like to say is just to come back to the point I made right at the outset, and that is that uh, we and Rory, and indeed in collaboration with some of the publisher partners that we work with, are now looking at how we might take this evidence-based approach forward and looking at other problems to do with peer review and other aspects of the scholarly communication system. And we'd very much like to hear from you if you're interested in working with us uh, in this way. So we're going to finish there. Thank you very much for listening, and I hope uh, you found that worthwhile, and we're certainly looking forward to hearing your comments. Thanks very much. Thanks. Thanks so much, uh, Stephen and Lulu. That, that was a great summary. The report's quite long, actually. It's really uh, worth re uh, reading because it does try and bring so much information that's that's been uh, uh, in different places um, across. I also wanted to say that uh, a key part of the Rory collaboration with the COVID um, Rapid Review Group was uh, PhD students. There are a wonderful set of PhD students working with Ludo and Stephen who helped with the data collection, the data analysis, uh, qualitative and quantitative. Um, and unfortunately, that they're, they're, they're not on online with us at the moment, but I do want to uh, uh, say a special thanks, uh, thanks to them. So now I'm going to, uh, uh, so one thing we are, we're hovering around about 190 participants um, at the moment. Please put questions in the Q&A. Uh, we also are very interested in your chat. Don't feel you can't chat to each other. Put your questions. What we might do at some point is, 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 is um, I'm the only, uh, I'm the chair here today, uh, but I'm also the only publisher. We might bring in some publisher responses from the audience if, if, if we can as well. Um, so over to our panel of responders, what did they think? Do, you know, so did, did, so how did publishers do? Or how did publishing do? Robert. Thanks. And uh, thanks to Stephen and Ludo. I think the first thing to say, it is an excellent report. And I think the last comment that Stephen made there is that more work needs to be done on sort of research on research. So, you know, the process of how we undertake research, how we evaluate it, how we uh, reward researchers absolutely has been shown uh, to be found wanting, uh, particularly during uh, this, this pandemic. Uh, I would 
thoroughly endorse what was said first, which is openness and open science is now an accepted practice. I don't think anybody argues against it. And I would definitely uh, re-endorse the point that yes, we're in a pandemic because of uh, COVID, but there are other pandemics ongoing like antimicrobial resistance and other areas. This is the way we need to move forward. Uh, and this is the way we need to work uh, in, the, in the future. I found it, uh, if we think about preprints per se, if we go back, say, even just to say 2018 or so, certainly WHO and I know many others would have dismissed preprints in the life sciences. They weren't even used uh, in any uh, meaningful way. Um, and certainly starting particularly with, say, Zika and now with the current uh, COVID outbreak, uh, that has completely changed. Uh, and uh, I think the necessity uh, and the speed uh, that was required through the utilization of preprints uh, has very much been found its way into the WHO system. So, for example, if I look at um, uh, some of the guidelines, the emergency guidelines that were produced by WHO, if we look at, say, the guideline on therapeutics that was published in March uh, 2021, WHO introduced a completely new system in its guideline process. Uh, in the traditional system, it maybe took between 18 months to two years to create a guideline. There was a systematic review uh, of published and peer-reviewed literature, and it was then assessed using things like the grade system, and then a guideline was produced over maybe a, a, a two to three year period. Now, in the emergency situation, we're having guidelines that are called living guidelines. They're available for you to read and look at on a, a space called Magic App. Uh, there is one for therapeutics, one for vaccines, and one for diagnostics. And as I said, if we look at, say, the edition in March of 2021 for therapeutics, this is the fifth edition of a guideline that was first published in November of 2020. But if we break down the references in that, in that place, we're looking at 44% of them are preprints, 30% or 33% were data shared directly with WHO. Less than 25% of the references in that guideline were standard, traditional, uh, peer-reviewed material. So what this tells me is when we needed the publishing system the most, it failed us. It let us down. It doesn't work in a pandemic. So we have, it's not just a question of, you know, should we be making the changes? We absolutely need to make the changes. And I think reports like this provide the evidence base for the way forward. Now, open access, and Ludo alluded to it, and I'm going to, I am going to sort of say something about that. It's not just about free to read. It is about reuse and reuse is exceptionally important. So the licensing system, uh, the, the CC li uh, license, Creative Commons license and others are exceptionally important if we're going to improve the way we use and reuse scientific information and how we integrate data and the narrative so that we actually improve the reporting and the understanding and the utility uh, of science outputs and, and science dissemination. So we definitely need in an open access world, we have to have things in a digital format, in a standard uh, um, software language like XML. Uh, we need it under a Creative Commons license or a free to reuse license. Uh, and that enable will enable us to do the things that we now need to do, like use artificial intelligence for the triaging uh, and understanding uh, of the literature that's, being, literature that's being published. Because what we found in WHO is with the tsunami of information that was hitting us, uh, is that the impact factor is entirely useless. It's, it's almost uh, a barrier to understanding the literature. It needs to be completely and utterly eradicated from the science system, uh, canceled, if you like, in the modern parlance. And that's because there is absolutely no association between an impact factor and the quality of the science that we're looking at. So there is an army of volunteers in WHO that has to read and understand and comprehend uh, a piece of work and judge it by the methods that it's using and the sample sizes as to its validity in informing guidelines. And I think this is where we now need to go. We need to go to a system whereby we publish first, we peer review second, and we achieve impact later.
because the current system is completely and utterly toxic. The idea that a gold medal is given to runners before they run a race is completely bizarre. But that's exactly what will happen uh, if you publish in a, in a so-called high impact journal. So that needs to get, get rid. We need to publish first, peer review second, uh, and then uh, it, um, impact is something which is gained and the value is attributed to it. So I think I'll leave my comments there. I'm sure there are other panel mem members want to chip in um, and uh, I'll uh, respond to questions and others. Uh, as they come online. Thank you. Uh, that that was great. So I think we've got the message. Uh, publishing wasn't there for the pandemic, which uh, uh, which uh, is really, really interesting. Now we're going to uh, turn over to um, Hannah um, from Welcome Trust, Hannah Hope, um, who uh, and the Welcome Trust was responsible for coming out with that statement. Um, Hannah, over to you uh, another five or six minutes. Well, we welcome coordinated it. It wasn't just our yeah. statement. Um, so uh, just to add my thanks for the report, it's been really interesting to you to read. Um, and it's it's great to see the response of um, us publishers and uh, publications uh, to the, the overall statement. Um, as some of you will know, Welcome has also commissioned its own study on the impact of a statement as a policy mechanism to deliver change. So that's a piece of work that's being done at the moment by research consulting. And the study is not only going to look at, from a bibliometric perspective um, at publishers, but it's also looking at all other groups of signatories that were involved and trying to look beyond the preprint or journal article format as to how information was shared and communicated and how the, the goals of the statement were, were met. And we're also going to be looking to conduct comparisons between what happened during COVID and Zika, because this statement was used uh, during the Zika pandemic as well. And we hope that will come out uh, around the May time. Um, but I think that study and, you know, as this one was, was very Anglo centric. And I think we should acknowledge that there's a huge volume of academic literature out there that is not included within these databases that are used for bibliometric studies. So I think I'd, I'd just like us to qualify our thinking about what happened and the responses that were made uh, to the report. Um, so kind of taking Rob's point around um, preprints and um, the, the, the ways information was shared, um, Rob gave the example of WHO. And I think although what we've seen based on peer-reviewed journal articles and in terms of data that shared link to articles and perhaps um, preprints, the changes might feel disappointing, but actually what we know is a huge amount of research is being trans is being done and progressing outside of journal articles. You know, I think we should recognize that publishers perhaps have too much power in science. A lot of science happens outside of this context. You know, they have a very strong, uh, strong, strong, or maybe some might say a stranglehold over research assessment that I think, you know, as Rob said, is uh, in inappropriate to enabling science to progress uh, and advance going forward. But at the same time, the fact that a lot of that information is being transferred privately is problematic. You know, there are only some who can see it, learn from it, and, and that is uh a concern for us. Um, another thing I'd like to raise that, that came to me when reading the, the report was this continued distinction between pre-printed peer-reviewed article and I think we need to be very careful within science. I think the power of peer review is limited. I don't think we acknowledge that enough and I think the value that peer review can add is at times overrated by our community uh, of researchers. You know, let's be honest, for most articles, this is two or three other people looking at this article. That is not going to solve all the problems. Um, and we need to recognize that yes, it adds value, but it doesn't create this kind of gold seal that we seem to have given it. And so I think we might need to think about how we reflect that in our own practice and studies of research and the way we present um, these uh, formats. 
And and so I would like to maybe suggest the idea that we need to start thinking about the scalability of peer review. There may be some articles that don't need it. Maybe they need only technical checks. Um, others may actually need greater peer review than they are currently given under the standard system. And, and so that that is just one area where I think it would be really interesting to explore. Um, for the, the piece of work around the um, open peer review, peer review comments, um, the article transfer between journals and publishers that the rapid review um, collective tried to initiate, I thought that's really interesting. Um, I think unfortunately, given our closed culture of peer review, it doesn't surprise me that there were uh, difficulties getting uh, article transfer between journals uh, being used significantly, nor that preprint comments predominantly happened closed. And I think there's a, a cultural issue there that maybe needs to start with some of the traditional um, peer review processes and, and opening those up. And uh, I think my final one was I was just a teeny bit disappointed to read retractions in the context of low quality research in one of the final paragraphs. And I, I recognize that oh, any discussion of quality is difficult, but I think we, we really need to destigmatize the retraction of research. Research is iterative. Initial ideas change early work will be um, deemed null and void by subsequent work. That is not wrong, that is science. Um, and I think that's very important that, you know, we all, when we, we work in, in how we discuss research, we're conscious, you know, it's a difficult process to go through. And, um, you know, we need to celebrate those researchers actually who have the courage to admit that there was a mistake. I'll end there. Uh, that was great. Thanks so much. So much, Hannah, Hannah and, and there's there's so much that can be can be discussed there. I just want a, a couple of things. Publishers have a stranglehold on assessment, so so that's not a that's not a weak statement, and the power of peer review is limited and overrated. I think that's those are those are those are great uh, uh, topics we can we can look to discuss. So now I want to shift from the sort of. Uh, 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 health uh, and, and funding agencies and move on to where innovation is, is trying to happen uh, at a more grassroots level. Level And first from ASAP Bio is Jessica Polka. Please go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all the authors of this fantastic report. Um, and, you know, just to riff off of, I think, Hannah's fantastic point, Research is indeed iterative and preprints really support that iteration. And so I want to agree with Robert that it is fantastic that we are now seeing this vocal support from so many organizations for preprinting and other open science practices. But nevertheless, the level of preprinting and data sharing uh, seen in this report was to me surprisingly low. Um, and I want to acknowledge that disciplinary variations could very well be at play here. Um, you know, in the life sciences, we saw that monthly preprinting on Europe PMC reached about 7 to 10% of the volume of PubMed. And certainly some disciplines are perhaps coming to preprinting uh, more recently. Um, but nevertheless, given all of the benefits of preprints and the stated encouragement from funders and publishers, we clearly have a lot more work to do. And this leads me to ask what happened in, in the implementation of this commitment to encouraging preprinting? Um, I, I think that it's obvious from Ludo's slide representing different uh, rates of preprinting associated with different publishers that you know, clearly publishers are working with different communities that have different familiarity with preprinting, but it leads me to question whether the implementation of this principle of encouraging preprinting differed. Um, and I uh, would love to see greater transparency in reporting how this principle and other principles articulated um, or uh, how, how that came about. Um, if, how and when was this con uh, encouragement communicated to authors and even beyond um, the need for clear messaging, uh, clear and obvious messaging that's built, uh, that's supported with 
you know, rationale and, uh, you know, good reasoning. I think there's, and this speaks to a need for good workflows and integration with preprint servers to really make it possible for researchers to share their work at an earlier stage. Um, and beyond the question of implementation uh, of, of, of this, uh, this aim, I think that there is some, uh, this reflects some kind of underlying, I think, discomfort with preprinting that, um, you know, clearly is varying across publishers and across communities. And so what do we need to do to make preprints not just nominally encouraged, but fully embraced by communities? Clearly, there's a lack of awareness um, among uh, many different communities about preprinting. But beyond that, um, I'm reminded of the fact that uh, we ran a small survey in 2020 asking researchers about concerns regarding preprints. And the number one concern in that survey was actually premature media attention on preprints. So we need to, um, you know, as Hannah mentioned, create ways for the community to appreciate expert opinion on preprints. We need to create strong, uh, clear labeling on preprints. And in order to address these concerns about misinformation, I think we really need to surface more uh, peer review and expert opinion on preprints. Um, so, you know, just to, to I think, uh, uh, continue to uh, emphasize and underline Hannah's points, we need to make uh, more of this encouraging 53% of preprints uh, receiving comments. We need to make more of this public. And we need to actually provide incentives and support for researchers to perhaps make their existing evaluations public. Um, but uh, beyond that, um, you know, I am excited to see, um, you know, uh, the rest of the discussion. I would love to hear from those of you um, in, in the audience, um, you know, what you perceive as uh, additional things that could be done to support preprinting other open science practices. Thank you. Uh, that's that's great. Uh, thanks, thanks, Jessica. And I, and I think I think this is really interesting because uh, uh, I mean I, one of the things that COVID has exposed is the lack of standards within the traditional publishing um, 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 sort of cycle. But preprinting is a whole new world, and no one knows how it works or how to be encourage adoption or how it gets checked even before it gets made public and uh, and all of this. And there's 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 a whole a uh, new set of community norms and standards that need to be de developed. And of course, there are going to be disciplinary differences. Um, and now um, I want to turn to uh, Stefano, and then we'll open up the discussion, um, who is uh, in the business of making his research available as a preprint. Um, and I also want to stress that his subject area is not, does not deal with COVID. And we'll, we'll, we'll come to this point uh, later, because although this discussion is very much about the COVID pandemic, the wider implications are about every discipline in the sciences and the humanities, I think. So, Stefano, please go yes. ahead. Thank you. So my main perspective on this report is that of a PhD student or maybe a generation of PhD students. They are not entering the world of scientific communication uh, where preprints are necessarily something new or experimental, but where journals and journal independent publication pipeline, they exist at, on the same footing. So in this aspect, in which journal end up having to in some way justify their added benefit compared to the alternatives that we students have in this moment. And to me, this report further shows that this justification of added benefit seems very hard because even in a life of, or death setting, like in a pandemic setting, the report shows like difficulties or, I mean, an unmet um, commitment in uh, sharing the data or ensuring that or open access to research. So in my blog post, I described my personal experience of how this journal independent path is possible. So you can publish openly as a preprint, so without journals. You can get your preprint peer reviewed independently from journals. And the question is to what extent do students and researchers know this and to what extent the 
communication and discourse around scholarly communication makes this clear. And so the big question I wanted to bring is the, the I mean, the reality that in my mind, but what if the solution to all these problems of communicating science at the speed of a pandemic, what if the solution are outside of the domain of action of journals or the benefit of a journal? So what is jarring to me from this report is as other have pointed out, the extremely low level of preprint given preprints on COVID research, given all the advantages, and seemingly lack of preprinting by the authors themselves not wanting to do it. Uh, but under the angle I come from, I still see many limitations in the report in how uh, many of the innovations in scholarly communications that are being described, they're still being described from the point of view of the benefit to a publisher and how does this fit into a publisher workflow? How does it help a publisher? Like for example, the post-publication peer review, the services that can peer review a preprint are presented as uh, a way to help publisher um, sort through the literature that is arriving to them instead as a real solution to peer reviewing literature openly and maybe better, at least more transparently. So what transpires to me is that what we want, which is an open, equitable, rapid, contextualized communication of science in a pandemic or not in a pandemic is already achievable through other means. So the preprint, the post-publication peer review of the preprint, the community engagement on this peer review preprint. And what the report hi highlights, maybe most for me, apart from this difficulty on, on, on talking about communication without publishers, is the need to focus all the attention on, on these alternative services, preprint servers, preprint awareness, uh, existence of peer review systems that are journal independent, the new types of peer review that is offer, and increasing the discoverability of these services, because the report also shown, showed that they were really underused or are not as known. Um, yeah, uh, in my blog post, I also talked about how this in practice poses difficulty to us students in the sense that, as was said, publishers have a very strong power in terms of um, prestige, let's say, or validation of research. But at the same time, this power is extremely weak because as soon as you don't care about it anymore, it, there's really little few advantages that you can find uh, on on publishing on a journal compared to not on a journal. Yeah. That was brilliant. That was beautifully said. Um, and I think there are, there are many really interesting points uh, that we could explore just, just in that uh, about your perspective and, and your experience of pre-printing. Um, this uh, discussion is going to be um, uh, quite challenging to manage. Uh, uh, we've got a lot of questions. Um, I'm just going to say that we're, we will try and respond to all the questions um, uh, in a blog post later. What I want to do now is just get Ludo and Stephen's response to uh, what the panelists um, have said. Um, and then I'm going to ask your help, all the panelists, everyone, uh, help me feel, feel the questions <clears throat> and, and, and see if we can pick out a few um, <clears throat> before the before the end of the session in about 20 minutes. Okay, Luda, Luda and Stephen. Right, so I could chip in first. Um, I, I think one of the really interesting things about panelists remarks has been, if you like, widening the discussion away from the specificities of the pandemic and how the scholarly communication system has responded to that, to broader questions about the future of scholarly communication. And that's where we wanted to go in the report, we didn't spend a great deal of time on talking about different models, but just showed how the pandemic had made, had illustrated perhaps uh, 
or given hints of ways forward and some of the problems and barriers associated with those way forward. So it's really gratifying to hear people talking in those in those terms about um, you know, the, 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 the sort of lessons learned that, that we can see. I think one of the one of the key challenges around quality control, if you like, um, uh, you know, which we currently do through peer review is how um, different models of that developed during the pandemic or maybe were, ex were accelerated during the pandemic. And, and some of them like um, reviewing or evaluating preprints are still very much on an experimental basis. And we're very conscious that initiatives in those areas that are very interesting are running on a shoestring. And so there is definitely a need for more resourcing in those areas, which have shown great potential. In some areas though, even those weren't quick enough for a pandemic. You know, the MIT Press um, overlay journal, for example, was you know, carrying out peer reviews in a matter of days. And yet by the time that they published their peer reviews, the press had moved on. <laughs> so maybe yeah, it, it, the, the quality control isn't even quick enough uh, for that, even though it's happening in days. And so it, it, it should be around quality, quality control happening at a rate which is appropriate for different situations. And I think that's, that's an interesting challenge there. It's quite interesting WHO, had to set up an almost parallel private peer review system in order to deal with this situation rather than relying on existing systems. So we've got different approaches to quality control. It seems to me there's a great deal of interesting research to be done there in terms of what works for what context. Um, uh, you know, I think that's a really interesting challenge moving forward. Perhaps I'll leave it there and I'll hand over to, to Ludo to make any further initial responses. Yeah, I, I, I really, appreciate all the all the responses to the report and I heard many things that I, I can only fully agree with. I, I think perhaps one of the key things that that actually I think all of you in different ways mentioned is is the need to, to move towards a, a kind of a different way in which we think about publishing in peer review and perhaps uh, Rob the way you in which you summarized it. Uh, publish first then peer review then impact. That's perhaps for me also kind of the bottom line. Um, and if we take that that perspective then it's of course disappointing to see that the first thing so publish first, which basically means preprinting that that already failed, basically. Uh, that's, that's disappointing. And the question is, for me, why did that fail? And it seems that we're all kind of guilty of, 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 of that failure because we all promised to do this, uh, but it didn't happen. Um, and and um, yeah, that's the thing we need to think about. It shows that there's a need to work together more, to not only make joint commitments, but to also think jointly about how to how to implement these commitments um, and it also for me it means that we need to think about journals playing a different role i think this is not so much about do we need journals or or don't we need them this is about what actually should journals do and i think journals will essentially be will be uh, 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 communities of people who have a, a joint idea about how quality assurance can be organized. Uh, and in that sense, I do think we need journals, but that's different perhaps from the concept of journal that many of us have at the, at the moment. It's journals that operate within the context of uh, the system that Rob mentioned, publish first, then peer review, then, then, then impact. Great, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Ludo and, and Stephen. Uh, I wanted to, to, to kick off uh, um, uh, just with one question, um, uh, um, uh, one general question, which came up in discussion with, with, with some of you um, um, uh, uh, when we were preparing this webinar, was that, that there is a, there is an, and I'm speaking with a sort of publisher hat on here, uh, being slightly, slightly defensive, because th there does seem to be publishers uh, publishers uh, didn't basically uh, step up in the pandemic. Uh, they didn't make a difference. There's a hell of a lot of work going on in journal independent pathways. I, I, I like, I love that that expression that uh, Stefano used. Uh, and there is this uh, 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 possibility. Um, and even down to the fact that, you know, publishers are in some ways responsible for the assessment system, which I would probably argue with. I think it's a systems problem, the whole thing. But what is the role, uh, just briefly, of funders uh, in, in, in this system? Where, where, where do funders sit in having an influence on the system and an influence and a, and a power to change the system? Um, and one of the questions that was actually raised uh, um, by, by Ludo was, 
funders themselves are very, very interested in, in open access and pushing open access mandates and policies and everything. They're far less interested in actually looking at peer review, how and when and where it works in the context of it, which I think speaks to, 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 to what Ludo is saying and Stephen as well in terms of the broader concept of innovation. Um, and um, so very briefly, I'm going to just pin, uh, I'm going to ask that question to, to Rob and Hannah um, and just see if you can, if you can uh, give a brief response to that. Yeah, I think obviously funders do have uh, a role to play on this and there are levers that we we can pull. But I think I, I do think at times our power is overrated beyond our own processes. So funders are very interested in peer review. It's around the peer review of grants. And, and that that is an area where funders spend quite a lot of time thinking we we probably haven't done as much experimentation as we could do and that's that's probably speaking um to more than just welcome funders but there is interest there um in exploring how we use peer review in the grant making process um if we and actually for welcome we've also explored peer review in the publishing process through welcome open research by um promoting a publish and then peer review model and an open peer review model. So there is interest, there is experimentation, um, but there is also a limit to, to how much we can do, I think, beyond our own communities of researchers. Thanks. Rob. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I agree with what Hannah said. I mean, but what I would add to that is, if, if we look just say at open access publishing, you know, the, the key players that made it happen uh, were frankly the Wellcome Trust and then NIH. Um, and now we have um, uh, the um, coalition plan S. And so the reason I say that is if we'd waited for commercial and society publishers to change, there wouldn't have been any change. Uh, and I can say that quite confidently. They have resisted open access for many years. We, in, well, when I was at Wellcome, we developed the first open access policy back in whatever it was, 2002. We're now 20 years later. So what, what actually is concerning me is that we don't see much innovation within the publishing system that comes from those that have to make money out of the system, whether it's for profit or whether it's to fund societies. All the innovation has either come from within the community itself, and I can think of like the community of Public Library of Science back at the end of the 90s, uh, for uh, more innovative publishers like F1000 and Biomed Central and these other, other areas. And I do believe, yeah, funders have a very significant role to play across the publishing system. And I think the other area which is extremely important and it has come up a number of times is how do we assess uh, academic careers? What is a measure uh, of impact? Um, it's interesting what was said, uh, perhaps, I can't remember whether it was Ludo or Stephen about perhaps the failure of preprints, but I would question, well, what are we measuring in terms of failure? The problem with bibliometrics is that it's extremely volume uh, centered, uh, whereas in actual fact, the example I gave was the, the biggest impact of preprints and even non-published material created the guidelines which are then used uh, by many around the world uh, in uh, how to um, administer therapeutics for COVID-19. Now, to my mind, if we only think about the pandemic, that is a good measure of impact. Um, whether or not we've got too much uh, fluff in the system and things that are being published that perhaps don't have the same kind of quality. Yeah, I think that's a, another question to, to think of. But I, again, it does. So your question was role of funders. Definitely, they have a role to play. They're not the only answer. I think Hannah uh, will, you know, said that. And I think my experience has been you can go so far uh, pushing your own community but outside of your community, you know, where do we have an impact, say, on historians or social scientists or, or, or you know, these other areas? And, you know, again, if I think within just, again, you know, because of COVID, 
you know, we've, we've been having to look at research that's being published in things like architecture and building design for ventilation in textiles in chemistry, uh, you know, across the whole gamut of, of science and research. And that's why uh, open science needs to be across the disciplines. It can't just move forward a pace in physics and, and now looking like the, the life sciences, you know, it needs to be a, a much bigger move uh, across, across all the disciplines. Uh, yeah, I heartily agree with that. There's, there's 17 sustainable development goals. If we could do for climate change what we've uh, done for, yep. for COVID, well, where would we be? Um, OK, so um, there's a lot of questions actually specifically um, about um, the, 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 some of the details of the report, in particular in relation to the rejected um, articles. Um, and um, there was um, um, one from uh, Lisa um, uh, Hinchliffe, um, which was uh, for the 75% rejected, do we have data on what went on to be published? And related to this about the, re uh, the re uh, um, rejected articles, um, I'm going to tag it onto another question, is about those articles um, that weren't made freely available. What, uh, I can't remember the specific question, someone can help me out here. Uh, why was that? Why were the COVID articles not made freely available? Where, uh, where were they? And are the proportion of free articles um, that have been made available but are not necessarily licensed for reuse, as, as Rob described, are they going to go back behind a paywall? Um, I'd love some responses either uh, from, from the panel about that, um, um, but we can also ask someone uh, who's, if they're willing to step up from the audience if they'd like to speak to that. Perhaps, Katriona, I, I could say something from the viewpoint of the analysis that we did. Um, the Lisa's question is a question that uh, we didn't address. It's a very interesting question. Uh, also a little bit tricky because we are dealing, of course, with uh, confidential data, but um, um, we didn't address it. It was kind of outside the scope of our work, but definitely an, an interesting one. Uh, the question about um, um, the closed content is indeed something we looked into. It's a bit of a complicated story, but the bottom line is that partly what we're looking at is all kinds of messiness in the data. So the, we, we use data from a number of data sources, uh, in particular the Dimensions database has been extremely helpful for us in this analysis, but any data source and in any analysis of this scale you find messiness, mistakes in the data. So when we manually sampled the closed publications and we took a look at them manually, we saw quite a few cases of publications that were misclassified, for instance news articles that were not really research articles. Um, we also saw um, cases where indeed COVID-19 research is closed, is not made openly or freely available. One example is a decision made by Springer Nature. They made all their um, uh, journal content, COVID content, uh, openly or freely accessible. Uh, that decision was not extended to their uh, book content. So the book content is not in all cases uh, openly or freely available. So that's basically the type of things we found when we looked manually at the closed content. Um, um, also, in, in relation to the um, accepted and, uh, and rejection rates, uh, Didier uh, Tordi has, has asked, did you compare the accept and rejection rates through time? So there were a lot of descriptive studies in 2020 um, and even negative results in, in very selective journals, which is un, unusual. Uh, you could perhaps make the assumption um, that at, f at first these would be published and then as the pandemic went on, there was less willingness to publish, to publish that type of research. Um, and is that worth exploring in terms of what sort of research got filtered at which point in the pa pandemic? It's not something we studied in, in our, our analysis, but I definitely, of course, see the relevance of this, this question. Okay, there's a lot there. Um, I'm going to ask for help because there's so many questions. Is there any, have, have our speakers spotted a particular question that you would like to respond to in the last few minutes? There's also some really interesting discussion. Um, oh, is someone 
Uh, well, it's just an observation yeah. on this idea of rejection and acceptance and what have you. And I think actually picking up on something that Hannah was saying around, I think we, we perhaps have to move away from the this misconcept that science is somehow static. Uh, and in fact, I'm beginning to think that things like version of record are an old fashioned statement that, that maybe are no longer useful. And the reason I say that again, if I look at the emergency guidelines, WHO, you know, there've been eight uh, versions uh, of the therapeutic guidance, which have had to adapt and grow and change as the science grows and science is dynamic. Um, and I think it's, it's also misleading to say, we are completely right at this point in time, let's draw a line under it. And, and this is the version of record. So again, it's another concept which has been held onto quite dearly again by the commercial and society publishers this idea that they are the guardians of the version of record I, i'm beginning to question whether we need a version of record we just need the best current version and good versioning control uh, and i've i have actually edited a paper which was peer-reviewed and uh, um, indexed in pubmed and then subsequently changed that we noticed a small error in the table and created a version three of a, of a paper that was you know version one two and three so you can actually see everything is all transparent and and out there so i again it's another one of these these sort of comfortable concepts that we we are now having to challenge i would say hannah you wanted to add something to that um yeah well i i i did want to say i didn't mean to I th maybe I perhaps I admitted to um, acknowledge the work done by publishers to enhance um, the processes that they operate with and and you know th there's only so much you can change at scale rapidly when you're maintaining within an existing system and so I think you know it is important to acknowledge what work was done to ensure a, a large volume of research was openly accessible and attempts made to um, speed up those processes. But again, I think it's about thinking about the where publishers, publishing sits within that broader context. And I think, as you said, it's, it's very much about the systems and the, the roles and the, the power of the different power dynamics with the different players. Thank you. Um, we're, we're just on time. Uh, there's, there's the discussion has been so rich in the chat, in the Q&A, it's going to, uh, we'll have this on the blog. Um, I would have loved to have pursued uh, uh, conversations with all the panelists individually. Um, and um, I think this is something we're definitely going to, 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 to pick up on, um, um, and it will be picked on elsewhere, not just at, at OASPA, in, in how, how we, we take a systems approach to solving some of these issues uh, uh, and collecting the information about what works where and when um, and, and develop numerous, potentially numerous different types of pathways, some of which might be journal dependent, some journal independent to, to, to um, uh, help move scholarly communication um, forward. And um, with that, I would like to thank all the speakers and the panelists and for Rory for leading the report and, and pulling that all together. I think there's, there's, there's many things to, to be discussed here. I think what we, we can come away with is that pre-printing is going to be going to, uh, uh, going to stay one way or another or with and without publisher involvement, <laughs> it seems to be. Um, and we look forward to um, uh, hearing more about different and context dependent ways of peer review throughout the, the, the research uh, cycle. So thank you all very, very much. Um, and um, uh, thank you very much again, participants. Uh, it was great you stayed, you stayed for a long time. I'm not quite sure how many are, are here. And also again to our sponsors um, and uh, the Royal Society of Chemistry. So many thanks and keep a look out for the next webinar. Thank you, everyone. Are we?